Well, now this topic is, uh, is, has been with me for a long time, actually, what works me hurt. How, how many of you been sick lately? Oh, a lot of you, that's why you are not there. So when you go get, uh, get medicine, when you go get medicine, what do you see normally? Do you see those warning labels by the, on the side, on the packet? Or you know, if you get Tylenol, uh, if you read that, it says, well, this may cure runny nose, but could cause a bleeding stomach, right? <laughs> it, it, you always see those labels, right? right? That's, uh, it happens, that's just, that happens uh, all the time in medicine. But in education, have you ever received such warning labels, information? Like uh, from a publisher, this reading program can help improve your test skills or decoding skills on testing, but may make your child hate reading forever. <laughs> uh, have you seen those, those, those? You've never seen those, right? Why is that? You know, because in recent years, you know, we, we've been very much into the idea called uh, evidence-based practices. Have you been to evidence-based practices? Have you heard about that? Evidence-based practices, uh, we've been talking up a lot about make education a science, and that's why yesterday I was coming on the great John Hattie out of New Zealand and talked about the visible learning. You know, the, that's all based on evidence, on science, and all those kind of things. But I have discovered that's actually, there's a lot more to medicine than education. So we like to always compare to medicine. You know, how, how did medicine advance? Because many people think it's just we collect evidence, we change. But the first question you need to ask is that, what makes good evidence? What evidence of what? Right? That, that's the big question, evidence of what? That's, so, the, so I started thinking about this. Okay, so if you think about evidence, there's some, some kind of issues that challenge me to think about. Here's something uh, I would like to, to share with you for you to think about. So this is a very big study. I will, let, I will explain later to say Early reading was associated with early educational success, but also was associated with the worst long-term outcomes, including less overall educational attainment, worse teenage and adult adjustment, and increased alcohol use. So, you read early, you drink more. That's, that, uh, that, that's, the, that's the idea, okay. So, so this, this study, by the way, I want to explain to you about this. This is very scientific, okay. This study came from um, uh, in the 1920s, when there's a person called Louis Terman, the psychologist at Stanford University, who really invented the Stanford Bennett IQ test. So he got into, he said he wanted to study, does IQ really matter? Of course, he believes so. So he recruited over 1,000 teenagers, children like 12 and 13, 14 year olds in California. And these are the top one smartest people according to IQ tests, highest scores, top 1%, 145 and above. And followed these people until they died. And of course he died earlier, that Louis Terman. Uh, and this study is called the termite study. Okay, the termite study. So they follow them every five or ten years. They would follow up with them to say, "How are you doing? You know, uh, are you healthy? Are you wealthy? Are you happy? You know, all those things." So it's a very longitudinal study. Then the discovery is this: for the smartest people, those early readers seem to not fare very well in midlife. Okay. So what does this mean? In the outcomes. Right? So this is one question for you to to ponder the question, people suggest something. Because in education, one of the issues that we've been trying to do is like medicine in early days. And early days medicine was very much into, uh, into, talk, into trying to figure out the cure that solves all problems. Do you feel like that? In, in medicine, what we call, we used to call the snake oil medicine, right? It, that, that's how, pre-modern medicine was really trying to invent the, medical, the medicine that's going to cure all problems. We call snake oil. We still see them, right? Do you have see a lot of people, people advertising like medicine to say, okay, this is going to, if you drink this, 
drink this potion, that's going to cure all problems, make you feel better, you know, and I don't know, you make your grandmother who is dead and might come back alive. You can't have those kind of promises. But in education, uh, we have the same kind of promises. Uh, they, so modern medicine got in because of major, major catastrophes in history. Uh, like, uh, first of all, we have uh, the uh, medicine that uh, caused the birth of deformed babies. Though that's after World War II, you know, those, those things. Then we have medicine that seems to be have cured somebody, but cost long term. So modern medicine emerged by first of a mandate, all medical products must be safe. That means doesn't do any harm. So you have to re the first thing that mod modern medicine is to, you recognize all medicine is poison. That is, it is going to do harm to you. So, oh my, so that's why today, we're the first we study that thing. But in education, we have always assumed every education, everything we do in education is doing good. Do you notice that we always talk about this is going to do good to you. So whatever we do, we try to assume this good. So from education to be more like a medicine, I think the first thing we need to do is to understand anything we do that could do harm, like the early reading. So this is actually the, how I started doing this research. Then you began to think about how, how could this happen? In what ways that could happen? So I've been thinking about, you know, so this is uh, in many ways it can happen because in education we have different outcomes. That's like, like something. First of all, we have different subjects. We have different specialization. Like yesterday, I explained a little bit of this. If you want to be good in this way, you have to give up on something else. Because time is a constant. Time is that you cannot expect yourself to have more time, you know, because you just study math. You, you can also be good at this and that. Some subjects are associated with each other. Others are not subjects. Then we have this, this uh, cognitive versus non-cognitive skills. And this is um, quite interesting. So let me show you something about cognitive versus non-cognitive. We all love creativity, right? People want everybody should be creative. We love that. But how come the more you go to school, the less creative you become? So like, you know, we, we measure children at age five, 98% of them are creative at the genius level. 98%. But after five years in our schools, not your schools, maybe other countries' schools, you know, it's, uh, uh, and when they reach year 10, age 10, I'm sorry, age 10, you look at only 32% maintained the same level of creativity. And age 15, only about 10% left. So this is, how could that happen, right? Is that we become less creative you know, as we go to school. And uh, you know, you can, this is actually quite interesting. So we learn to be less creative. We get to become uh, age 44, you can see about 2% maintained the creativity of genius. Of course, you're happy. Retirement is there. Uh, after retirement, we become more creative. Creative gets bounced back a little bit. How could that happen? Uh, how would you explain that? It's, well, it shows you to you that creativity can be malleable. But also, when we go through our life, we learn to be less creative. Retirement brings back, basically, she used to say, I don't care anymore, right? I think a lot of you have something looking forward to. Uh, you can behave whatever way you like in you know, after retirement. It's, uh, and, but this shows to you that how schools can be damaging to creativity. So there's some study, uh, another research, uh, piece of research was uh, quite fascinating. So this is from, um, if you can read, you can read this article. Uh, it's called, Why School Shouldn't, Preschool Shouldn't Be Like School. This is from neuroscience research. And their finding is quite interesting. That is here. 
It's basic in both in neural research, neuroscience research, shows teachers always been right. That direct teaching, direct instruction can limit young children's learning. That is, they, they say that teaching is a very effective way to get children to learn something specific, but it also makes children less likely to discover unexpected information and to draw unexpected outcomes. Yes, teaching can make you less creative. So this research, the experiment comes from like this. So this is um, two scientists, I think from MIT and uh, UC Berkeley psychology lab. So they were doing this on four-year-old children, you know, very young children, and to play with a toy. So they divide these children into different conditions. In one condition, the children were told how to play with this toy. You squeak this box, you hear the sound, you pull this lever, you do that. In another condition, which basically the teacher or the psychologist said, wow, children, I don't know how to play with this toy. You know, can you go play and discover what, you know, what this can do and how do you play with it? As you can imagine, under the first condition, the children quickly learned how to do it, but then they quickly lost interest and they did not discover anything new. And now under the second condition, the children played with the toy for much, much longer and discovered new ways. And they tried to find new ways to do it. They invented new ways to do it. So this is, again, when you teach, when you're doing one thing, are you going to cause damage to creativity? So this idea called modern science is that medicine does this all the time because they have different outcomes. Like for example, you can, as I said, take the medicine to cure your cough, but it can truly cause you to be drowsy. In educa and education, a big message here is that we cannot expect one thing to provide cures to all, and there is always a trade-off. So you should talk to your policymakers, ask about what do we care? What matters? So in this one little study, do you care about the children's creativity or do you care about how much they know the knowledge? If you expand this a little bit more, let's think about reading, think about math, think about history. A lot of times in our content standards or expectation of grade one, grade two, we always rush to say, okay, this is, these are the facts you must know now and a lot of our measures based on that and then you move on, you're actually causing damage to children later on. Is that worth it? So this is another called outcome. We need to say, okay, is New Zealand a country that prides in our creativity, or are we proud of our children being able to memorize how many prime ministers you've had in the past? And we do that all the time, right? So we have this urgency. So this has to do with um, another big study we always know is called the early reading. Early, I showed you early readers drink more. That's uh, if you guys want to, uh, you could, you have become a, a country that drinks more. That's, that's always good. It's, uh, and uh, because you make wine, it's, it's, this is good. It's, uh, so th th this another, uh, uh, another series of a lot of, lot of research has shown the, the same thing. But what, what actually comes down to the fundamental question you shall ask has to do with um, this idea of um, what matters in education. Since we know there are different outcomes, what matters in education is something that everybody should question in, in all our pursuit. And I don't know in, if you, have, you are aware of this. This is uh, the Polynesian. This is actually on Easter Island. The choice of outcomes that matter to a nation is really important. The Easter Island was discovered later on by Westerners going in there. Many people had questions about why do they have these giant stone statues? Who built them? That puzzled a lot of people. And that many believe maybe someone from outer space or others created. They said, locally right now, the few thousand people living on the island could not have produced these things. So that's the puzzle. The anthropologist discovered, indeed, 
their ancestors of the people living on the island created this. And it is because of this creation that destroyed the civilization. On Israel, they had, a, they had this huge, very thriving civilization a few thousand years ago. But they got into a different way of thinking. So they decided whatever the, the indicator of power, of prosperity, of strength is expressed by the size of the stone heads you can cut. There are 13 tribal families on this island. So this is like get your schools, get countries to compete on the PISA scores. Right? And you know, the, the international test is like set up countries to say, you know, whoever can score higher, you have more, you have a better future. So these people believed if they can cover the bigger, gigantic stone, they would please the God and then God will bestow a better future for them. It's again, like a pizza, right? It says, okay, you, we test, you get a better test score, your 15-year-olds will, will thrive better in the future than other countries. So people got in this competition, they got in the contest. And in order to carve out the stones, they have to move to the other end of the island, cut down the giant oil palm trees, transport them. Basically, people neglected everything else and did not take care of animals, they did not take care of their fish or boats, they just were devoted all their energy to building gigantic stones. And that caused the collapse of the civilization. So choose the outcomes. What matters to you? Does test scores matter? You know, so this is why you can think another way. It's, uh, in America, you know, for example, a lot of education reform efforts in recent years have been driven by international tests. Have been driven by so, so the U.S. has always justified its reform efforts based on the idea that America is in decline. American education is getting worse. So that's the definition. I think a lot of politicians, including those in New Zealand, Australia, have always tried to justify that we are getting worse than other countries. So therefore, we need reform. We're losing the global competition. So this is how America has been arguing about that. So I said, okay, is that true? After some historical examination, I discovered American education is not in decline, is not getting worse. It has always been bad. <laughs> it's been bad for a long time. So based on test scores, again, so <coughs> this is the US. 1960s, 1964, actually 65, that's the first international mathematics study uh, began. And uh, so you can say in the US, in the first international mathematics study, Americans 12th graders ranked 12th out of 12 countries. Now if you know math, that's pretty bad. Right, that, that's, that's bad. And in the 1970s, 1980s, you know, because FIS means first international science study, SIMS is second international math study, TIMS is actually third international mathematics study, but because it got so popular, they retained the name for the subsequent studies. Now it's called Trends in International Mathematics Science Study. New Zealand, I think, participated in part of that. And that's so, so you can see from this American education, American schools never scored well. So based on this, if you're 12 out of 12 countries, America should not be here. They should have been destroyed by those poor test takers. So I mean, if math were important, if they were so bad, how come? So this is why you, you come to think, why is America still here? Uh, Trump may, get, may, may, may make it actually go away, but it's definitely not the test score, not, not the test scores. Definitely not. That, so why did that happen? So then you began to say, okay, what does the test scores not measure, the outcomes? So what matters in, in that way? So then you began to examine something, right? okay, let's take a look at this. Who are the highest test takers? The Chinese, the Japanese the Koreans, the Singaporeans, anyone who uses chopsticks. 
uh, good test takers. Is that that's that's so we call the East Asian countries, right? So that you you've been you've been here. Let's look eastward, East Asian countries, and then they said, okay. By the way, you know because of the PISA test takers and uh, there's a lot of people trying to learn from China. It's uh, in Britain, for example, you've seen uh, over half of the uh, schools are using Chinese um, uh, math. In, in you know, UK, half of the England primary schools have imported Asian Chinese math, actually math from Shanghai. They've been importing math teacher from Shanghai have been spent 75 million pounds. In the Brexit, that's a lot of money. They don't have money to buy other things, but they bought all this program and uh, it has not worked. Just two years now, they just released a report, British kids' uh, math scores are not up. But even if they were up, what did they lose? So you go back to explain the America idea. What, what happened there? And so I began to say, okay, you look at the uh, team's results. U.S. students versus Asian countries. And uh, American students really are at the bottom. They, they can't compete possibly with Singapore, with Korea, with Japan, with Taiwan, with Macau, with Hong Kong, impossible. So but then they, all these tests measure another side of the coin, a top of cognitive versus non-cognitive. They always me measure something called confidence. For example, do you think you're good at math? You know, you can score, but do you think you're good at math? Do you think you want to do something with math? As you might expect, Americans are not very good, but they are very confident. <laughs> so they said, well, you know, well, but I think I'm good. You know, okay. So, America, seriously, American kids, they're, you know, they, they're bad, but they think they're good. So it's, this is the idea, but uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> now, as a nation, as a country, do you want your children to be confident? Do you want them to believe they can do math? Do you want them to think they have no interest and they cannot do math? And this is, goes on like, not here, but also here they can go on like, uh, it's a lot of study showing the same thing. Look at this one. I said chopstick using countries. Uh, the, math is, the math scores are much higher than the Anglo-Saxon countries. And now, you look at the confidence level. And do they value this? And this translates into other studies. Like, uh, for example, I did a PISA study. On the PISA, PISA rating and entrepreneurship indicators in essence, all negative. Countries that has higher test scores, children have lower entrepreneurship confidence. So you found your children to go out there, set up businesses, try new things, invent new industries. Test scores don't lead there. Now, so again, what do you want to be proud of? And I've already explained to you how creativity can be damaged by test scores. But now here, you can show us, even in that society, look at long-term societal impact. What would you like to have? And this actually hasn't talked about other measures yet, right? So th this is uh, just PISA, you know, if you look at this study, the high score countries are the red bar, that's math scores. You can see the top math scoring countries. Singapore's entrepreneurship is very low. Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Finland, and Switzerland. And uh, Japan, do you, you see this? Do you want to be those countries where your children don't feel like they can, they have the confidence to set up businesses, to invent new things, to create new possibilities? And today, in this new age, as we said before, is that what actually you're looking for? So education that produces high test scores could cause damages in other domains because we have different outcomes. And this actually has been recently confirmed by PISA itself. 
PISA scores recently have been uh, showing that um, a lot of times when test scores go up, your well-being gets damaged. Have you re been reading a lot of the PISA scores recently uh, about, about re report called Student Well-Being? Uh, that has been recently released and it's quite interesting. This is the well-being from PISA itself. PISA since 2015 has begun to accept my challenge to them. I said, can you publish the other variables, other outcomes? This is what they have. It's, this is called life satisfaction and test scores. You can see the, well, this is a, that is the above average science performance but low life satisfaction. Look at the countries there. China, Macau, oh, that's basically, again, the chopstick countries. And uh, look at there. It's, so you definitely don't want to be here where you are bad at everything. That's no good, OK. And uh, the, the, you don't want to be there either. But what actually the whole point is that it's not a matter where you want to be. Certain type of education that can generate high test scores can cause damage to children's life satisfaction. It's a, and so they, um, of course, actually almost, you can say Netherlands, Finland, Switzerland, they think they are pretty good up there on this measure. Children may be happy, but there's another indicator they didn't do, and they cannot do, it's called homogeneity. You know, they say, well, I mean, they did not homogeneity measure. So if you put homogeneity up there, I bet Netherlands, Finland, Switzerland, they will be very down. You know, they, they have a very homogeneous. But why does homogeneity matter? Because if you, in a, today's culture, if a country completely relies on a homogeneous set of workforce, the civilization is very likely to collapse. So, but no one has measured that part as a society. How diverse are your talents? It cannot be measured right now. But history can tell us something. Let me share a little bit about this. Okay. If you have only homogeneous, if everybody has the same talent, what, ma what happens? When new technology, new changes come in, you will not be able to sustain the big changes. The example is, um, again, China. You probably know that 1840, the British Empire defeated the Chinese Qin Dynasty Empire with the, it actually, it's, it's almost inconceivable. Think about a country at that time, 1840, China was the largest economy. If you think China is big today, China was bi much bigger many times years ago. China's uh, GDP was three times, was actually one third of the whole global GDP at that time. China was the country people wanted to be. But it was beaten by a tiny place. You got, you, you've been to Britain, right? Do you know how small that is? And you know, London, you know, they're always covered in fog. They probably don't know where they are anyway. You know, just, but <laughs> but they, they, they found their way to China. They beat China. So you, you begin to think, what happened there? What's going on? And something very simple. Homogeneity of talent. China has been doing this thing called uh, imperial exam for over a thousand years. The only you know, one imperial exam, the emperor's exam, was basically driving the whole education system to select and value only one type of talent. Those who can remember Confucian classics, those who can produce beautiful poetry and Chinese paintings. And they become the dominant. Anybody who pursues science, technology, were not valued. So that's why when Britain at the same time was in the Industrial Revolution, they had all kinds of people working out here, here. So that when the new age comes in, the industrial age comes in, there was no way China can deal with that. Many people are still ask me, do you think China can lead the next in, uh, age innovation? I say it depends. If the society doesn't open up, to allow dissenting voices, different views, different talents to thrive. There's no way, no matter how big it is. So, but, so this map did not do the homogeneity. I bet if you go to Finland, 
you know, Finland's biggest issue is homogeneity. Their talents are very homogeneous. Their thinking is very homogeneous. We have a harmonious society. You can have two different kinds of harmony. One is we ever thinks the same, another thinks different, but operating different rules. So, but it doesn't matter to Finland, honestly, because it's such a small country, right? I mean, they can, they can live on angry birds. <laughs> you know, why industry works? It's a, New Zealand is in the same way. However, as a, as a global society, what matters? So America, don't, you know, if they're test score, why is America still here? It basically says American education has, it's bad, but has allowed something amazing to, to, uh, to be there. So I said, you know, if you think about every education system is trying to become a sausage maker. Remember yesterday? Like we, yesterday I was showing you that how education is trying to homogenize people, how to make people the same. That's what education was yesterday. So like, let's call it sausage, uh, sausage makers. And, but America somehow has an education system that's a broken sausage maker, but happens to make some bacon. <laughs> and that bacon is what made people survive. Because when you have new industry come in, how do you know everybody likes sausage? That's yesterday I was talking about. You have to make a bet. Everybody loves sausage, let's make some sausages, right? But then people somehow taste changes. And then after a while, you need some bacon. And that's how it succeeded. So I would just you let's use this to illustrate. How did America succeed despite the bad test scores? Actually, the system that produced bad test scores but produced something else. So this is called a broken sausage maker. Basically, what America has done, there's, there are the, the, the six or seven traditional virtues of US education. Many people think it's bad. I happen to think it's good, okay? The number one, public provision, public funding. What does that do? That gives you a diversity of talents. Because as public schools, if it's public school, public funding, you do not get to select children. You allow everybody in the system to play for 12 years. You cannot say, I don't like you, you know. You, everybody has to be in, but America is losing. By the way, I have very little hope America can continue because America is losing all of this stuff, okay? So, so because America is allowing more charter schools, more privatization, more marketization, I hope you will maintain this idea that public provision, public funding are very key. That is, we allow everybody in our school system I'm not going to explain the separation of church and state, but it's general ideas that, you, again, you maintain a system that is not driven by one set of ideas. And then you will enable more diversity in your talent. But local control and decentralized, open and forgiving, this two are very important, this too. I know in New Zealand and other systems, they like to, because people are in the age of efficiency, like what OECD and PISA and Drea Schleicher, they've been promoting. That's efficiency, short-term efficiency, actually can do long-term damage. Uh, so I hope, New Zealand, you'll give a lot more local control to your schools, local decisions, and every knowledge is driven by profession, not by, by, not, not by national mandate. What does local control give you? Local control makes your schools different. Local, you have your response local community, you have local leaders, you have local students, parents, they create more community and more diversity in what children experience. Because you can respond to local environments. Rather than make identical New Zealand schools, you should have 2,000, 3,000 different kind of schools. So, of course, you will say, okay, from an efficiency perspective or from a government perspective, from a command and control perspective, 3,000 unique schools makes it very hard. You look, oh God, it's such messy. It's so messy. No. And some of them will not be so good. 
So that's why we try to you know, standardize, centralize, make it better. But I can bet you this way, that we have 3,000 schools. It's much easier to have some schools discover new possibilities. You know, if you mandate everybody to be the same, you're not going to improve the quality of every school, but you actually have stifled space for innovation. That's, so America's allowed this local schools. America's one time over 100,000 school districts. So even half of them fail, you have 60 left. And this is why in the US, some people, you know, today I know many countries began to admire authoritarian countries like China. Oh, they can pull the whole country to build high-speed rail. They can do all of those things. That power can do good, but also can do tremendous damage. And I think one, one Supreme Court judge in the US said, it's a good thing America has 50 countries inside, 50 states. You know, if one state fails, others can learn from that. But if 50 states behave the same way, why would you even have 50 states? So local control is very important. And of course, the open and forgiving. American education, I think was like New Zealand education, used to be very open and forgiving. That is, we do not predetermine you at age five. We do not predetermine you at age 18, or we do not predetermine you based on your test score. We do not define you with a test score. In Singapore, in Korea, in China, in Japan, they are not forgiving. If you fail one test at age, let's say 10, your life is predetermined. You know, we, we define, I hope New Zealand schools will not try to determine your kids, determine their future by giving one test. This is also, by the way, brings another point I want to make is that today we have so many diagnostic tools. Early diag diagnosis has become so prevalent. It's a bad idea. Do not test your kids like H5, H10, and determine the given prescriptions. Do you know we were so eager to do early detection? That's horrible. You know, when you do that, you have narrowed the path. You have actually deprived them of possibility to reinvent themselves. But America didn't do it. So make it a loosey-goosey system. You may not test well, but actually it's a better, more human society. So this is about the American, why is American education still here despite their horrible, horrible test scores? So this is called what works may hurt, but also what works may hurt can show up in other domains. So you can think about, when I talk about cognitive versus non-cognitive, test scores do not measure other important things, such as creativity, entrepreneur thinking, Resilience. And then we have this non-cognitive versus non-cognitive. Basically, there are some personalities that don't go together. Something we try to pursue that do not go together. Let's take, uh, um, let's, yesterday actually, we, we, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, we invent new concepts all the time. And uh, yesterday we, I talked about the four C's. In essence, that can, can be called non-cognitive. But the four C's, do they really go together? You, you can think, can you be collaborative and creative at the same time, for example? Because we like our children to be, to be able to do all of this. But in my thinking, it's probably not very likely, okay? Collaborative means you actually have to spend time in the traditional sense. Collaborative, you have to spend time to listen to other people's opinions. But you know, extreme geniuses, they don't compromise. They really don't, don't sacrifice. I'm sure many of you are here like, like the, the same way. How do we think about it? Us mediocre people, we can be a little bit creative, a little bit collaborative, you know, we're fine, but we're useless, you know. So, uh, so we'll we do that. But if you want to be extremely creative, you really don't have time to worry about that. You know? So that is, in, in your school, you th if you have children who have extreme deficit, has extreme genius. That's the basic idea, because they don't necessarily go together. Okay, so, so do you, as educators, do we want to suppress that 
Do you want to support that? And then we have this idea called uh, instructional outcomes versus educational outcomes. What's an instructional outcome? Instructional outcomes are basically what do you try to accomplish on a daily basis. You have, a, let's say, you have a 20 words you want these children to master over a week. That's the instructional outcome. What's educational outcome? Educational outcome is about the person you are looking at, the individual growth. So let's just take a look at just one thing about um, uh, school engagement. You know, if children don't come to school, you don't get to educate them. But a lot of times, our behavior, which we, we try to emphasize the instructional outcome, actually has damaged the educational outcome. It's a, take a, there's actually a very stand, uh, well known story about this. So, when a person comes to a store, try to buy nails, okay? And then the store manager asks, What do you want nails for? I said, I want to put, you know, nail a frame on the wall. Okay, I said, why do you want to do that? He said, well, I want to clean my room. You know, so it's a good story. He actually does not want a nail or nails. He wants a cleaner room. In education, don't you feel a lot of our instruction is not really about that knowledge, it's about a better person. So we have seen, for example, reading. Reading is a good, interesting data. Actually, it was because it was in Victoria, you know, is Gabriel still here? I don't think we got Victoria. And uh, Victoria in Australia has been really trying to drive up the NAPLAN scores. You know, that many countries try to do that. And nobody will find out their efforts might work up to third grade. And after third grade, this thing drops. And you can't do anything about that now. America did the same thing. America in the night in, under George Bush. We had something called the Reading First, and that's six billion dollars given to poor schools to say, let's sit, well, and they're using called scientific methods, read direct instruction in reading. And then they, after many years of trial, nothing happened. You can see a slight movement in the first and second grade in decoding skills, decoding, okay, and then changes. So what happened basically is this. When you, you can move early reading by improving first grade outcomes, instructional outcomes, but that decoding skills got children hate reading, got children not having comprehension, got children not to spend time on content. So when, when you after third grade, reading assessment is more about comprehension. It's more about content. And so that actually has backfired. When you spend time here, you drop later on. So this is, again, instructional outcome short term to the long term educational outcome. And that happens all the time. So what, what are we looking for is also matters. Then you have to think about other outcomes, the short term versus long term. That is, we have this uh, idea, sometimes we call it um, productive success and unproductive Sorry, unproductive success and productive failure in education, long term. So, you know, sometimes when you teach, you know, like uh, reading, uh, that's an example. You teach this decoding skills. You may say this all the time, by the way, that in, in teaching, it looks very successful now, but you've stopped children from exploring, like those toy plane ideas. The same, a lot of times you may have productive failure. In the beginning, you, know, you talk about learning to be resilient, learn to do something. So a failure may actually be more productive in the long run than right now a short-term success. I hope you can think of, contemplate about that. Think about that, that case. So I'll go back to reading again because that's really kind of my field, thinking, early reading research. In America, there is a, a general belief that reading by third grade is very important. I'm sure that news has reached New Zealand. So everybody saying early reading is important. If you don't read by third grade, research shows your chance of going to jail is higher than others. 
Have you heard about those things? It's a third grade reading seems to be a big predictor of your life success. So in America, we are spending a lot of money to make sure children can read by third grade. It hasn't worked. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is this. First of all, people don't understand causality versus correlation. Who cannot read by third grade? Poor kids, underprivileged children, children who do not have the resources. They're going to jail is not because they cannot read. It's because their family has determined that. Second thing, if they cannot read by third grade, why do they fail? Shows our school systems do not know how to help those children who cannot read by third grade. It has nothing to do with them. It's just, so when you, even if you spend all the money, all the time, trying to alienate those children, put them in the reading remediation, you're not going to help change their life course. It's, that's not the problem, the, the issue. So that's what, when we try to emphasize this then, we try to, actually right now in America, because we spend so much money, so much time, getting children to read by third grade. We have very unproductive successes. Decoding skills, synthetic in you know, our phonetics, which I teach them. Basically, children can decode, but they don't care about reading. They don't know they can read. They're not given time to enjoy reading, you know, all those, those kind of things. So that's, one, that's another thing about. Then comes to another point, that is individuals. Individuals versus groups. This is actually quite interesting. Individuals versus groups. That is, uh, <coughs> in research, we always do stuff like this. We, we seek for correlation. And uh, if you look at, uh, uh, again, uh, John had his work, visible learning, or other things. Basically, I'm trying to summarize probability, you know, about effect sizes, right? So this method is helping these children more and others. So we run this correlation. So how do you, well, I hope, I think you guys all know what this means. Each dot is a child. Just imagine each dot as a child. And the success, whatever measure success can be, that measure could be reading scores, math scores, or money you make. And this one is whatever factor you can use to do this correlation. That you just don't, this can be intervention. Okay, just ignore this one. So what do you see if you are in this, um, in this quadrant? If you're here and there, you drive up. So you align, basically you benefit. The higher you have, the more you do something, the more successful you become. Okay, so this gets, 0.5, that's very significant. But now if you look at those three children out there, and there are many children over there, they are the opposite of that. So they are the ones who have been hurt by these methods. So if you think about all your systems in your schools, when you do one method, you know, do one way, you have some children benefiting, some children get hurt. So this is like a, a medicine. Yeah, if you try a medicine I give to, to 10 people, and I kind of helped five and killed another five. Okay, so I killed another five, but the correlation is still high. It's still significant. Should we allow that medicine to apply? We don't. Actually, but, but in education, we do this all the time. We, we just give to our, we say, okay, if it's significant here, that's applied to everybody. So your Ministry of Education, professors in schools of education always come to say, okay, look, the significance is 0.5, it's 0.3, let's use it. But for whom? In medicine, you know, we always ask questions. When it cures, it hurts. When it cures somebody, it can hurt other people. This is why in medicine, you know, you have to say, okay, do not take this if you're allergic. Do not take this if you are pregnant. Do not take this mixed with alcohol. We specify conditions. Under what conditions does this method work for whom? Does this method work for whom? So here's an example. You know there's, um, again, PISA. 
Now, from by now, you think I hate everybody, you know. Uh, I do, but you know, it's a, especially it's things like pizza. So you might have heard of this thing. <laughs> have you heard about this? Everybody has heard about this. How can you not? Okay, this is derived from PISA study. Your minister, minister of education loves to hear this. The quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. It sounds really catchy, but it's wrong. Okay. So why is it wrong? A system has to start without teachers in the beginning. Who is the first teacher? Do you see what I mean? That's, that's more, more important. But that's not my point. Okay, my point is this to say, because of this, people began to derive to say, okay, what, is, what does quality of teachers mean? You know, so they began to say, okay, a good teacher, this is actually the lesson they draw from. The top performing systems we studied, this is from McKinsey, uh, the top performing system is Korea, Finland, and Singapore. So they'd come up with this answer and said, okay, their teachers are from the top third of each cohort of graduate from high school. So this is why I know in uh, New South Wales, in Australia, has been trying to apply. America, many countries from China say this one. We want our teachers to be the top graduates from high school. They're basically trying to say our existing teachers are too dumb. They're basically, they're, they're, not, as, they're not the smartest kids anyway. So this has, has actually had a huge policy impact in different countries. I don't know if it's happening in, uh, in New Zealand, but it's still happening in Australia. So they want to mandate test of, of teachers, candidate, teacher candidates. They want to you know, get more money to recruit the top ones. So they believe this is true. Well, first of all, this is actually not true. I talked to Pastor Sauberg, they said, Finland does not recruit students from top one third. But again, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing I found is this. Is this a longitudinal study research You can read this one. It's from uh, Sweden. That's interesting. They follow a lot of studies, Sweden. So they follow a lot of teachers. They track their high school performance as academic. So basically what they find is that our results indicate that a general increase in teacher cognitive abilities, that's kind of high school testing, would increase achievement gap between high and low performing students, both by raising achievement of high performing attitudes and lowering it for low performing ones. What does this mean? This means those high scoring, high school graduate students who become teachers help high performing students but hurt low performing students. It's quite interesting, right? This is, that's what I showed you. To, you know, that, that thing. So this medicine, you know, you know, you can imagine those guys who score high, they come in, who do they like? They like the high performing students but achieving low uh, hurt low achieving students, and then you can see basically said, well, high high ability students benefit from being matched to a high cognitive teacher. Such a match is even detrimental for lower achieving students. Low performing students benefit from teachers with high social abilities, while the effect of teacher social ability had negligible effect on high aptitude students. So this is very complex. So as school principals, when you hire teachers. We match teachers to students. What would you do? I would say diversity. Again, you want people to have a diversity of talents, a, a community of different kind of teachers, not as one policy to drive that. You know, so even the quote, high school teacher can hurt as well some students. Now, there's also other many other kind of studies we've been uh, I've, we've been tracking. For example, what uh, methods can hurt? I don't know if you do charter schools. You don't have charter schools here, right? You don't have those sort of right privatization. But people are arguing for privatization competition. I'm sure that trend may come to New Zealand if it's not here yet. So in America, it's been talking about school choice, right? The school choice has become a big deal. So we need to introduce competition. So one form of school choice is called a voucher. Voucher, that is, we give money to the child and parents, and parents can take the money 
go choose to go to other places, private schools, most from government school to private school. Donald Trump and better divorce than divorce the new government in the U.S. is pushing this a lot. We take you know so government gives you money and you take money to do something, and this is a study by them. They call it it's a win-win solution that everybody wins. I said really, so I, I can't take that. I said there's no. It's impossible to have win-win situation. Someone has to lose. So I tracked down their study. So this is what they claim. They said they look at all the empirical studies. They claim that um, basically that everybody wins. So I said, okay, that's not really true. Is that? Let me show you this. How? So they do the study. I said, okay, they claim everyone wins. This is the. By the way. This is how they use evidence to mislead. But I tracked the evidence that way. Look, based on the situation that there are about some, six studies has positive, and eight studies positive for some, and negative two, and there's no implications. So this shows it's not true. So how did I do that research? So first of all, choice benefits some parents, some children. And in this study, we see. Parents of higher income, higher education level, their children benefit. Black parents, parents who have low income, because they cannot provide transportation, they cannot make the choice. Actually, get hurt from this kind of choice of places. And also, none of this. By the almost all the studies so far, all the research so far today, only report one type of outcome. Only, that is test scores. That is test scores. So almost all research today, you know, when doing meta analysis, empirical research, the only outcome they measure is test scores or grades, and those have very little actual influence of a children's future. So when you read I, th these things, I call them pseudoscience because science needs to have a value judgment. So when you read whatever, you know I have, a, you know I, I'm sorry to have kept mentioning John Hattie because his work has had most impact. I, I have no problem with John. He's a good friend. I like him, but his research is can be very misleading because the visible learning only tracks instructional, academic outcomes. It doesn't say anything about in, in about other parts. So when you make use of those things, you have to be. Very careful to say, okay, what are we applying? What are we trying to achieve? And also, all those methods is about statistical probability. It's not about individuals. It doesn't tell you who has been hurt because of this. It does not tell you who does not benefit from from this this study. As in education, we as Educators, as principals, have to be very careful in thinking about: Does it help everybody? Who does it help? So, in my research, the whole idea—I'm just giving all of this stuff about this. By the many of you were trying to email me, I feel free to contact me. I'm going to leave some time for questions too. But this is my contact information. When I wrote this book, what works may hurt. The idea is actually fairly simple. If we want to become like medicine, to advance our field, if we want to become evidence-based, we need to question first of all, evidence of what. We need to. Re that's something really important. I hope in policymakers like to talk about evidence-based. They talk about what works. You know, America spend money build this thing called what works clearinghouse. Try to only allow government to fund. Research or methods that's been proven to be working, but you want to say, okay, working for what purpose? Working under what conditions? Working for whom? And that's that's. So I'm I'm actually begging all education researchers have to begin to disclose the negative impact and the positive impact. So when somebody comes to a school to market to you a policy, a program, a method, you ask them, okay, well. At what cost? Not, not money. At what? So yes, you can have this flashy chart show me 
Yes, this has helped my children going up this way, but what did I lose? Did I lose some children? Did I lose some other, other outcomes? So what can we do? When government pours out evidence from wherever it comes from, you should ask the question again, at what cost? Yes, Shanghai has been doing great on the PISA test in math, but what did they lose? Well, they lose a lot of things. When, you, when, a, when a child spends 14 hours a day in school, you don't have time to explore the world. You don't have time to think things beyond the testing. You know? So you have to ask that question. This is what we need to consider. So I want to bring this to a close to think about this. I'm not trying to confuse you, basically. I'm actually giving you something called common sense. You know there's this saying that there's no free lunch, right? There, that, that applies to every field. And this is not meant to incapacitate you either. That is, means tell us that education is evidence-based. But you need to ask question, what outcomes do you want? Education can be a science, but a big part of education is not science. It's value-driven. As a society, as a school, as an educator, you need to make a choice on what actually you want in education. That, that, that is not scientific. That is value. That is community culture. That is what do we as a nation want? What do we as a school want? And once you make a determination what outcomes you're pursuing, science can help. Science can say, okay, Yes, this can lead you to that outcome. This can lead you to the, another outcome. But there's no one method. There's no one factor that works for all children. So let me just give you one more piece of information to make you kind of more confused before you go home. It's uh, recently, because I was talking about, you know, great has become important. Resilience, great, and growth mindset, right? So I'll just show you this one. This is a very confusing data. That's this is called meta-analysis. It basically shows great can explain very little of everybody's success. We have this 0.15, that those kind of correlation, that's very low. So far, nobody has found one construct. Test score, grades, growth mindset, resilience, great anything that can explain everyone's success. It's a very small percentage. And not everyone. So it's always a unique combination of this. Actually, sometimes great and growth mindset, as I said before, is bad. Because you need to not be so resilient. You should give up. <laughs> you shouldn't be. Like a lot of times, I actually I said, I wish some people should, would just give up. You know. Don't keep trying on this stupid thing. Why, why would you do that? It's, so you just have to reflect on those things. Re, 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 rethink it. You somehow need to jump out. Okay. All of this is controlled by this one idea I proposed when yesterday. I think it's uh, Glenn kept talking about different cranes for different cutters, whatever, different people. I, I, don't, I didn't grow up with this crane, so I didn't know those analogy. But it sounds very good. Okay. It's, uh, so, to end this, to this, what I think uh, where we are, the Renaissance idea. Renaissance really brought us back to humanity, to people. I think Renaissance also is actually the beginning of enlightenment, of uh, science, of science. But science is governed by humanity. Again, what you can do doesn't mean you should do. That's again, science has to be subject to human values. But in education, because we got into this empiricism, we began to say, okay, evidence. It sounds like evidence is so cool, but without questioning what evidence actually will lead us astray in education. So I leave you with one thing. If we can, we should revive the humanity in all of our education before we turn education into a trivialized or trivializing an engineering endeavor. Education is a human endeavor. Thank you.
Thank you.